<laughs> so you might remember we have a tiny, tiny little lecture called uh, Digital Design and Computer Architecture. Anybody still remember what it's about? We want to build cool computers or we want to understand how cool computers work. And we did all kinds of annoying stuff. I don't know. But now my promise was that after the break, after the Easter break, things would get more interesting. Yes, it will get more interesting. Trust me on this. So what we are going to do now, uh, we will spend these two weeks trying to understand what happens in a processor at the lower level. We are not talking about the high level. We will tie the situation. But before we go and uh, start building the processor, now that we know how digital designs can be made, and our only goal is to make cool processors or understand how they are built, uh, we have to look at what we want to design. We have to understand what it is we are designing. So this was what we were, uh, what we were discussing about, our abstraction level. So most of the time uh, in your computer science studies, you'll be at the higher levels of abstraction. Since I come from the digital, uh, from the electrical engineering, I operate mostly in these directions. And... Um, what we want to go now today, uh, in the next couple of weeks, we want to understand how we can use these parts that we now know how to design, how these digital logic blocks look like, uh, these digital circuits, AND gates, adders, memories, how they can become the processors that we are using in our work. But we will make a jump now, one step up, where we define what the architecture is. So that one is your view of what the processor does. However, while we are doing this, we will actually think about, we are not just designing any architecture, we have some concerns. We know now what lies underneath. We haven't designed it yet, but we know there are certain things which are difficult uh, realizing in hardware, meaning that, I mean, difficulty is not like I have to spend time, I have to spend money. The performance isn't great. The power is too much. So I have these concerns about the design aspects of a processor. And knowing this, I will try to find a, a compromise, a compromise between making it easily programmable, something that can be used easily at the upper levels of abstraction, whereas not sacrificing too much or taking advantage of our knowledge from the lower parts. So the architecture is, um, defines what, how the processor speaks, what kind of operations it can do. The microarchitecture then implements them. So we will first talk about the architecture. We will talk about the goals of the architecture and why we want to do it. And then we will be able to def uh, design the microarchitecture once we know this. And while we are doing this, we will use all our knowledge from uh, the, the earlier parts of the lectures where we are combination, sequential circuits, blah, 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 they will somehow come and merge in. Since uh, I have one more bit of logic design left, uh, and those are these memories, today I'm still going to sort of kind of talk about them, but tomorrow we still have to have one last lecture where we talk a little bit about uh, circuit structures because it's the last one we need to make everything work. How does the plan sound? Good, let's go. So, assembly language. So the processor, uh, <laughs> people are too hyped up. <laughs> you have to cut on sugar. So, <laughs> to command the computer, uh, it will speak a limited set of, uh, uh, of words. And essentially, instructions are its vocabulary. Th those are the words it can speak. Those are the things it can do. And the instruction set is the entire dictionary of words that the processor understands. Now, anything that you want to accomplish in a larger computer will have to get translated to these individual instructions. And uh, you, you 
can define the library as you want. If you are the computer architect, which is one of the most fun things, you can, you know, you have a, a blank sheet of paper and you can design anything you want. Obviously, at some point when your imagination hits reality, you will have to realize maybe that wasn't a good idea because trying to implement this would cause me too many issues. So we are going to talk about someone who realized that designing processors was not going in the right way. And he tried to establish some rules. We are going to see the reduced instruction set computers. Why making too many instructions wasn't a good idea at his time. Now, uh, there is also something that we call the machine language. And the difference is actually very simple. Assembly language, although they look very primitive, the, the words, the instructions, they still, you know, for a human eye with a little bit of imagination and support, you can read them through. Machine language is just zeros and ones. They are one-to-one -one translated. Whatever you see in assembly, we will see in a few seconds, uh, they will be translated into boring zeros and ones next to each other. Uh, so that part uh, is, I mean, the human readable format of the instructions will be called assembly language. The computer readable zeros and ones version is called machine language. So what, what about this story? So there is, there are, if you're re reading about computer architecture, there are two people from the past that are very famous. There's Hennessy and Patterson. Uh, and uh, John Hennessy was longtime president of the Stanford University. And he came up together with his colleagues, uh, the reduced instruction set computer that we will be talking about today. Uh, very popular uh, processor these days, RISC-5 is a continuation of the trend of the same people. And uh, what were these principles? What was the thinking? Now, we have to go back to the Moore's Law kind of story. You have to go back to the 70s. And when we were first able to build transistors, we couldn't build many of them. We had two, we had four, we had 16. At some point, we had a couple of thousand transistors. And with those, you could reasonably build computing architectures that could do meaningful work. We send, uh, uh, you know, uh, there was this Voyager that went out of the solar system. It's still running a processor from 1970s, a four bit processor. You know, it was good enough to leave the solar system, so it can't be all that bad. But after a while, we got more and more and more transistors, and the limitations we had, namely, uh, the, the, the number of things we can implement and some of those things were no longer that pressing. In the meantime, you have developed some architectures. Those architectures, for those architectures, you developed programs that run on them, built libraries that, that take advantage of it. And translating these was a very difficult. So the easy choice was making sure that the new computer architectures were compatible to the older ones. So some of the choices that were there as part of necessity, some strange quirks, some strange workarounds, stayed there for a long time. And uh, NEC and Patterson, they were also teaching. And you know they have such a class. And they realized that maybe simplifying the entire story would make life a little bit easier. So uh, they also understand more from hardware. So it's not only uh, looking at it from the architecture point of view. Uh, then they said, hey, instead of having a complex design, why don't I try to make it simple? Let's make the common case, the things that I use most of the time, very fast, very efficient. And then I can combine multiple small efficient things together to make the more complex things, which will take longer, but they happen every so, um, so rarely. And then uh, in the end, you realize that there is not going to be a magical solution. If you are trying to make things small, efficient, tiny, you will have to make some compromises. So today, we will see what they came up with, why they came up with. And uh, you will, in your professional career, you may not even be so much interested in how, the, how your high level program is translated down into assembly and machine language. However, uh, the architectural designs and the decisions uh, that we discuss are more or less the same. People may end up taking different decisions 
but there, uh, there's not much difference between a MIPS and an ARM uh, RISC V processor in their design too much. Now, how does it look like? On the left, we say, see the high-level code, the very exciting addition, A equals to B plus C. And in MIPS assembly, this would look very similar. We have what we call a mnemonic. In this case, it's called add. We have a destination operand. The result will be written to A. And B and C hold the values we want to add them together. Now, this looks simple and boring. How do we do subtraction? Well, guess what? We have a different mnemonic, this time SUP, ABC. Everything else seems to be exactly the same. Now, these two are instructions of the MIPS architecture, and there is a couple of them. The question is, how many different instructions do I need so that I can make useful programs? Do I need five, 10, 1,000, a million? And uh, what kind of compromises can I make so that these, these things can run faster? Now, one of the ideas that they started with when developing this architecture was saying, hey, I want to have a consistent instruction format. What are we talking about? When, when you will be encoding these, looking for chalk here, <laughs> When you are encoding these, in the end, they will become all zeros and ones in a line. And they said, when we are talking about the 32-bit architecture, I want to make sure that the instructions can all be expressed in, let's say, 32 bits. Anything, any instruction that I have should fit into this size. Is this mandatory? No. It just makes life easier if you know that Every instruction is 32 bits. Well, easy. What's the alternative? Well, the alternative could be if this instruction is add, read five more words. If the instruction is multiply, read seven more words. If the instruction is string compare A and B, whatever, read 54 new words or something like that. I mean, the, the uh, choice of things we can do is limitless. However, making sure that, you know what, no matter what we do, every single instruction looks exactly the same, makes life easier. Not necessarily for the programmer, but for the poor hardware guys who have to design it. And since this is a digital design and computer architecture class, we are in the position of designing them, and we will appreciate, actually, that uh, there will be a consistent instruction format. The other thing is, you know, there's a lot of operations, A and B, A X or B, A plus B, A times B, C minus D, whatever, where you have two operands and one destination. You know, two numbers come in, one number come out. So let's try to, let's try to keep this. Let's try to have as much as possible all instructions in this format. So this is what they are thinking. And now you would say, but what happens if I want to do more? Like, I mean, you know, adding two numbers is fun, but what if I want to make something like this? Then you say, well, it's easy. I have an add instruction. I will add it, put it into a temporary variable. 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 <laughs> Not variable. Variable. <laughs> okay. Stress. And then I will continue the subtraction and have my uh, result in the end. Now, Yes. No. I mean, it's a choice. And uh, everybody wants to show that they are better than the other one. Uh, this works out quite well for microcontrollers and, and other things. What happens in, I mean, towards the end of the lecture, uh, people from the Safari group will also explain much more complex architectures. There's all kinds of funny tricks being played. You think that the architecture is something, but in the background, it will be mapped to other architectures and things like that. I mean, this is a, uh, in the 70s and 80s, we tried all the simple things and sort of exhausted them. If you want to be good, you really have to dig deep and uh, do a lot of interesting things. It is quite common, though, because it works surprisingly well. Okay, second thing, second design uh, principle is 
make the common case fast. You look at a typical program, uh, you see what happens when you take that program, compile it, it gets compiled down to assembly and machine language, and you see what kind of building blocks come up more often. And then you realize that, okay, I'm moving data back and forth all the time. I'm using these type of instructions. Let's make sure that these instructions are executed well, because they seem to be in the majority. And if I can make them better while sacrificing the performance for some of the others, overall, I might come out on top. So this is one of the uh, idea. So uh, when they were developing MIPS, they said, I want to include only simple, commonly used instructions so that the hardware that does it can be small, simple, and efficient. This means that I could implement them and run them faster. Remember when we were talking about the combination logic delays and everything, everything, if the work that you need to do in a clock cycle remains manageable, then you can also finish that faster, meaning that overall you can do things faster. So uh, as we saw before, you will do more complex, uh, more complex operations using multiple simple ones. Now, this is a little bit unfortunate uh, because when NSC and Patterson, they came up with the reduced instruction set computer, that was something new because there were only computers. It wasn't like in the 1970s, people sat around the table and said, let's make a complex instruction set. They didn't do that, okay? They just made an instruction set. And after a while, people observed it and they saw that that instruction set had too much variation. Instructions were of different length, the operands were different, it was encoded differently. And they said, look, we are spending so much effort and resources doing it, Let's invent something new, call it risk. And it sounded cool. And by definition, when you, when you give an adjective to one type of architectures, you need something else for the others. And those poor guys got complex. Like, you know, you're complex, you're not nice. But it wasn't like people set out to make a decision and saying, I want to make things complex. I'm just trying to protect the poor cis guys. Uh, the very common example is Intel's x86. This is what you see in most Intel computers, although it also evolved uh, around the time a lot. And uh, just to you know, protect the poor Intel guys, really, they didn't want to do it complex. They were forced to, um, due to the, uh, let's say, technical capabilities of the systems at the time when they were building in the 70s, 80s, they were forced to make some compromises that didn't age well, let's say, it. because once you had too many transistors, those tricks were not necessary, maybe strictly necessary. And since you, you ended up trying to be compliant to the old architecture, um, it grew, let's say, awkwardly. When you make a fresh start, of course, you can you know, make your decisions new. Okay, now, uh, any operation, any kind of pool, addition, subtraction, multiplication, FFT, whatever, it needs data. It needs operands that it can uh, take, modify, and then later put aside. Now, where can you find the operands? We saw during our uh, lectures, we had these flip-flops, and a collection of flip-flops we refer to as registers. So everyone could hold one bit, and we said, hey, that's a place where we can store some data. Yes, sorry, question. Uh, could the sys, uh, so Intel instruction sets change with new generation? Uh, do they always just add on, or do they take out some old instructions? <laughs> I mean, technically, they maintain the compatibility, whether or not underlying. So there's always this story that we tell people how it looks like. And then under the hood, maybe we are not doing things the way that they are described. So this is certainly happening in modern processors. We are still compatible to the old, the old x86 uh, instructions, but we are translating them. Uh, for a long time, it was added on. And then after a while, under the hood, they were modified. Uh, you can also make the argument, if you look at the modern RISC-V or ARM, which are known to be risk processors, 
and uh, you know add a couple of extensions and say how come 460 instructions is still reduced right the the arguments from the reduced instruction set came because you could print all the uh, instruction set onto one A4 sheet of paper, which, by the way, we also usually give as part of the exam so you can look it up so you don't have to memorize. So that were the times, but then they added more and more and more. Anyway, coming back to the operands, we can pick them from registers, which doesn't really... Um, um, I mean, if you think about it, they were kind of funny things. Uh, in, your, in your laptop there, I mean, where is the flip-flops, right? I mean, it's not something you identify with. So most of the data resides in what we call memory. We are going to talk about how it looks inside tomorrow. Uh, suffice to say, larger amounts of data can be stored in memory. It is just not as fast and immediately available as registers. Then, during programming, for a surprising number of times, you also use constants. You have a for loop, you start incrementing by two, four, one, whatever. So in those cases, you don't maybe need to load the number from a register, from a memory location, but it can be part of the instruction. The instruction can say, please add two to the number. Please subtract four from, uh, from this number and write it somewhere else. We call these uh, constants, or in, in most of the uh, architectures, they call them immediates, because they are immediately available. They are part of the instruction itself. In other words, they will be somewhere in these 32 bits, we will hide the constant that we are going to use in our operations. So, this is going to be a team, and this team does not end, actually. It's one of the most annoying things in computer architecture is how can I access the data? How can I move data across uh, different systems inside a computer, inside a laptop, so that I can process them? We can build a lot of processors that can churn a lot of data into useful knowledge. If only they can get enough data. And uh, the main memory in your computer, located as like these big cockroaches somewhere in there, takes actually quite a bit of time to transfer its contents to where the computation takes place. If you were to do this for every instruction, for every operation, everything would take too long. It would be something like, OK, let me add two numbers. Give me one. Hold on a sec. Let's go to the main memory. Hello, A, please. Yeah, really like that. I mean, seriously. Here, A. Oh, I also need B. Really? OK. And then, 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 then. And you know, once A and B are there, OK, C, done. Like, I just brought you the data. I mean, so this is one of the issues. What happens is that instead of going this long way to the memory, we will see also other in-between solutions. But inside the processor, we have some of those flip-flops, some of those registers that stand very close to the operational units. We call them registers. They are exactly the same thing. But we have a collection of them, a set of them. Most processors would have something like, eight to 200 registers that are integrated inside the processor very close to the operational units. In this case, the MIPS architecture works on 32 bits. I mean, most of MIPS works with 32 bits. So everything is 32 bit. And because we like such round numbers, 32 is a round number, okay? Anybody disagree? 32 is a very nice round number. It's 2 to the 5. We love 2 to the powers. So we have 32 32-bit registers. Makes total sense. It's a 1,000 bits. I mean, come on. And uh, you call MIPS a 32-bit architecture because it works on 32-bit data. And if you want to be simple, when you work on 32-bit data, you also use 32-bit instructions. Everything is 32. 
No confusion, nothing. There are other alternatives, of course. Uh, historically, there is also a 64-bit version of MIPS, but in this lecture, we are exclusively, whenever we talk about MIPS, we are always talking about the 32-bit version. Now, smaller is faster. Uh, you could have found any number of registers to put into, the, into our processor, right? I mean, I could have also said, let's have 1,000. Why not? Let's say 5,000. It's just like whenever you need to look for something, if there is, I mean, the example is quite good, actually. If there is a 1,000 books on your table, trying to find the book you're looking for will take longer. If there is only a few of them, you will be able to immediately access the one that you are looking for. So there's a compromise to be made. Of course, you want to have as much data as close to the processor as possible. It's just not going to work. So you have to make a compromise. Now the question is, is 32 good? Would 16 also work? Or do I have to have at least 64? Now those are interesting research questions. Those are things where computer architectures like grind their teeth and you know, have arguments and other things. Uh, if you're the boss, NSE Patterson, whatever, you say, my architecture uses 32, 32-bit registers. End of story. And uh, there you have. Now, you have 32 of them. Uh, anecdote, if you go back to, let's say, my time being a student, we had processors which had three registers or four registers. So once you come to 32 in those days, you're all of a sudden like, 32, seriously? What will I do with all those registers? And people start saying, you know what? We should maybe specialize. So if you look at it, these are the register numbers, starts from zero, goes to 31. And uh, let's look at the first one, zero. The first register is not even a register. You cannot write to it. It only holds the value zero. I'm sacrificing 3% of my registers just to hold the value zero. Because I, you know, all of a sudden, we didn't have any registers. And we said, here is 30. OK, let me, let me use this as zero. And let me use the next, no. And then uh, they realized that, hey, there is so many. Let me maybe give them some, some uh, special purposes. Not that they are part of, not all of them are part of the um, microarchitecture, but it's an agreement between, let's say, programmers that they will use it in a certain way. Now, next week, we will see how programs get translated into assembly. And there, we will see the differences between what we call these S registers, the T ones, the A ones, the V ones, the SP, the RA. We will talk about them more. But technically, they are more or less all interchangeable, maybe except the first one, maybe except the last one, and maybe except this one. That compromises, right? So how does it work? They put a dollar in front of it, so this convention when writing the MIPS instructions and uh, before their name. So register zero is written as dollar zero. Uh, either you say register zero or dollar zero, etc. Now, there are some specific uh, uses, as I said. Uh, this one all zero. There are what we call saved registers. There are temporary registers. And in our exercises now, for a while, we will only use uh, these 10 and these eight to work with. It doesn't mean that we won't use the others, but uh, we will expand on them later. We're super excited how to make an operating system with 32 registers. So translate them back to the same instruction. We have A equals to B plus C. Uh, we know that the mnemonic was called add. And now we, have, we are going to add the content of S1 to the content of S2, and the result will go to S0. Implicitly, somewhere, this one was probably mapped so that the uh, variable A is in S0, the variable B is in S1, the variable C is in S2. We managed this somehow. That part of the story is not here. It's a given, let's say, when I arrived here, S1 and S2 had those values, and I write the result there. Still OK? OK. 
So this looks good. Of course, all our programs will only use 32 values. If we have uh, a you know, small club and there are 35 members in the club, we cannot even do simple bookkeeping uh, or we have to kick three people out. And uh, that's not very nice. So we have to be able to uh, transfer from the memory data into those registers. Now, we also, uh, we also uh, call these architectures a load store architecture because the way it goes is you never really operate directly with the memory. You copy from the memory into the register and you operate on the register. And once you are done from the register, you copy back to the memory. Why is that? Well, they looked at the operation difficulties and the common cases and things like that. And they realized, hey, if I'm adding 50 different addressing modes, life will become difficult. So let me just uh, operate only on registers and have one way of writing and reading to the memory. Can I do everything I want to? Sure. Let me do this simple thing well. And if I need to do complex things, I will use versions, parts of it to make life a little bit more interesting. So if we can manage to keep things that we want to work in, in the registers, operations will be fast. If we need more memory, there are ways to transfer data from essentially an infinite size memory back to our processors. Now we talk about memory. What does it look like? Next, uh, no, tomorrow I will talk about what is inside. But so far, what we have to understand is uh, memory has a certain size. In this case, we have 32 bit words. These numbers are in hex. So 4 bit, 4 bit, 4 bit, 4 bit, 4 bit, 4 bit, 8 times 4, that makes 32. Everyone has an address, like a street address, like Remy Strauss 101, 100, sorry, 100, 101, 102, 103, right? And at every address, there is the content uh, that corresponds there. So a 32-bit value can reside in every address. Sounds feasible, right? This looks OK. How can I read from here? OK, we need a new mnemonic. And the new mnemonic is called load word. I want to read uh, the, from this memory a certain part. In this case, we say read a word of data at memory address 1 into S3. And it seems like the most logical way to do it is to write this, load word. Now, you will agree that this makes a lot of sense. I'm going to load it into S3. This part, less so, right? Do you agree? I would want to write something like, uh, I don't know, address zero or address something like that, right? The address of this, uh, sorry, address one, sorry, sorry. What am I doing? That would make more sense. I don't know, maybe it makes more sense. No? It doesn't make sense, this one? This is better? This is better, okay. <laughs> what am I talking? <laughs> okay. The way this works is we have a base register. In this case, we are using our special register, which is called zero. This is our base. And then we can add a constant to it. And here is the constant. And in this case, the constant is 1. We do the ridiculous calculation of taking the content of register 0, which is 0, and then add the constant, which is 1. And then we get the address. So this equals to content of S0 plus 
constant. In this case, it's one. So the address becomes one. Yes. How large can the constant be? We'll come to that. It will be uh, yeah, 16, I guess. 15 bits, 16 bits, plus minus 32,000. Not so bad. How? Sorry? Uh, in this case, I, I want to go here. Somehow, you know, I woke up and I said, I'm writing the program, and I said, I want to know what is here in the memory in the address one. I mean, I'm not discussing how I came up with this address because it came out of the rest of the program. We will see examples, especially next week when we go more into how, program, how programs are translated, how are arrays translated, where it is located, and then it will make sense. Now, this is really, what I wanted to show is, this is really a weird way of doing things. Wouldn't it be easier if I just wrote the address here, like I did before? You might say, when you are reviewing this in July, and it's hot outside and saying, why are we doing this? The reason is we want to keep the number of instructions little. And this thing, this type of thing will become very useful at some point. We will need this. And then you realize if I need this instruction, if I need this type of addressing, and I know that this is very useful because I will end up using it a lot. Right now, we don't see why. But we will, it will be cool, leash. And uh, if I have this already, I don't need a version where I just enter a constant. You say, if I can have it register plus constant, even if I don't need the register, I'll be OK. That's the price you end up paying for simplifying everything and trying to reduce the number of different instructions you have. Convinced? Questions? No? OK. I hope I didn't lose everybody. So here's the explanation once again. I promise I won't go to the. Yeah. So the same story, memory address calculation. At the base address, the base address is in the register. To the offset, it's a constant one. So the address is whatever is inside this register, and this is a special register, its value was zero. It doesn't matter. I mean, whenever you turn it on, it will always be zero. I add one, I get one. And now I know where to read it from, and this is the location where my data is located. So when I make this read, when this instruction is finished, S3, my register, will contain the value what was here. So this is the F2, F1, AC07. Now, I used $0 for the base uh, register. It could be anything. It could be any register. I mean, in this case, I knew that I'm going to a constant address, and uh, it was somehow practical for me. So I say, I'll, I'll just use this, why not? It could be really any other register that is in the system. We had 32. I, you could use any of the 32 in this manner. You could also write back to any 32 except zero, because zero will always be zero. Yes, question. Excellent question. Excellent. I wanted to have this question because this is the strange part. Um, what you have to understand is this type where we have a, a base plus an offset will be needed. Next week, you will see so many examples where this comes super handy. I need this. If I have this, I don't need to have an extra instruction where I, I uh, you know, I just have what you say, just a constant. It would be possible, but then I have another instruction. And you realize that both instructions could do exactly the same. 
it's just for a poor student, it just looks like unnecessary work. And it is, I mean, for those rare cases where you know the address exactly, and it's a constant value, and it could be encoded into the space available, you say, this seems to be overly complicated. It is not the most direct, most simple way of doing it. However, it makes very good use of available resources. You need that type of instruction for other things. And since you have that, you can go into the, let's say, inconvenience of adding a dummy register here to which you add a constant. But it's, it's an excellent point. I mean, it should bother you, honestly. But it's part of the package, part of the compromises that were made. Now, we read writing is going to be very simple. We call them stores, so we had load, and then we have the stores, and it looks exactly the same. We write the value held in T4 into memory address 7. Now, this thing, this is our base, plus 7. Sometimes I realize this causes confusion here in the class. Back in the day, a lot of people use C, and this is, like, let's say, the C notation for hexadecimal, putting 0x. Uh, it was meant to make life easier for people. Uh, maybe I need to update the slides. Uh, anytime you see 0x, you, we are trying to say it is hex. Yes. Uh, good question. This depends on, you know, this is for you, for humans to read it. And uh, it will, there would be an assembler that takes the, the code. Honestly, I don't know what the default is. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it is that type because MIPS is from those years. I wouldn't be surprised if the default is decimal, but they accept this. And in a lot of memory operations and things, we would be interested in hexadecimal notation just because the numbers are very long. Decimals will pop up uh, in structures, in structs, because you know how many words you go back and forth. But a lot of times you will see this. It could be part of the MIPS assembler uh, definition. Okay. So this is the same story. Memory address calculation, base address at the offset. Uh, this one holds zero plus seven makes seven. And uh, yeah, here, that's the answer. The default is decimal or hexadecimal. And uh, it's not written here. So this is third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, somewhere here. Now, whatever was in T4 will end up in that memory location. There we did it. We did some great work and I think yeah, I think this is a good point to take a break. And then we will continue at 15 past, where we make life a little bit more interesting.
Ja, das ist richtig. Anita Max Win. Ich melde mich auch mit Namen vor. Stell dich mit Namen vor. Ich sag schnell was zur Funktion der Sprecher und dann gibt es die Leon. You need to shut them up. Yes. <laughs> okay, okay, everybody. Let's get going. And before I start, you have some colleagues that want to say a few words. Hi guys, we are uh, Julius and Salomon. I'm Julius. Uh, Aram, we're, I'm Julius. That's Aram, and we are this semester semester spokespeople for DDCA. And uh, like the others, we prepared a survey. You will have to fill out. I mean, you will have to fill out in uh, in a week. I think you have a week time. And uh, that's just for us to get some free feedback about uh, DDCA, the professors, and also the labs. Yeah, we'd love ourselves some constructive feedback. If you can just fill out some questions of the survey, you don't have to do the whole thing, but it will be greatly appreciated to improve the lecture. And we always want to hear what you have to say. You can, uh, sorry, you can reach us under these emails. So this is uh, Julius' email, this is my email, and this is like the general email that you can use to contact any of the semester spokespeople. Um, you'll find all those emails also in the description of the WhatsApp chat. And you can also figure out how to contact the semester spokespeople overall. And yeah, um, we'd like for you to fill out the survey again. It, you can find it in the Edu app under dashboard, just Edu app dashboard. We'll uh, have it stay open for a week and we appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Thanks. The feedback will be completely anonymous. I didn't hack anything. I don't have the passwords, if you believe that. Okay. Now, we do this a lot. I'm sorry, it's, it's kind of a habit. We start explaining things which makes a lot of sense. It's, well, not all of it makes sense, but We start simple and then uh, we make a mess of things. So I want to keep up the tradition and uh, notice that this memory addressing only allows you to address 32 bits at a time. However, if you are like more byte oriented, you say, but I want to be able to access individual bytes. I don't want to read all 32 bits I want this byte. So there is 32 bits, it's four bytes. So there's this byte, this byte, this byte. There are four bytes in it. And why, why, oh, why do I have to always read 32? I want to be able to read every byte individually. That's a choice. That's a choice you make. And uh, in MIPS, they decided that they want to have this choice. They said every byte should have its own address, not every word. So, well, this is, well, one of them is zero, one, two, three, and then four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So the word addresses end up incrementing four by four because every, every uh, memory location holds four bytes. So the next location starts from address four, the next location from address eight, the next location from address C, meaning 12, uh, then one zero, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, notice that whenever we write numbers, addresses, data, unless it's very, very small, like zero, one, two, three, four, uh, we usually consider them written in hex. Uh, the book and sometimes also my slides aren't that consistent. So if you want to complain. Uh, so these are the words. So the first word occupies four bytes. The second word occupies four bytes, et cetera, et cetera. That has some uh, smaller complications, if you want. Uh, you can now also have, uh, when, you, when you are reading byte addressable memories, we are going back to the example. We want to read this uh, first word, not, not word at here, but the one that was in word address one. If you want to read this now, my constant is no longer uh, one, but it ends up being four. Okay. 
I'll get you an exam with this one. So it's an easy one to uh, confuse people. The first word, like the zeroth word starts at zero, the first word starts at four, the uh, third word starts at eight, the fourth word starts at C, et cetera, et cetera. They, the addresses increment by four. That's a choice they made. They could have said, you know what, bytes are out. I don't care about individual bytes. If you are like still playing with little bytes, you know, I don't care what you do. Use like 50 different instructions. I am a word person. That, they could have said that. At the time they decided, no, bytes are king. I want that every byte has its own address. This is zero, this is one, this is two, three, four, whatever. And when you are reading uh, a word, you have to realize that you are going here. And this also now makes sense because it says this is a load word instruction. It is going to load the entire word. Now, writing is the same. So store word. Uh, now I want to write to the 11th 32-bit memory location. Well, I have to go to 11 times 4, 44, or in hex 2C, and I have to write my instructions saying that I want to write base plus 44 so that I can write to the 11. Now, I'm doing all this entire story. There would be no sense to this story unless I also had instructions that would allow me to read and write individual bytes, right? So now comes a very interesting question. Coming back to this thing, we know that this somewhere here is zero. I agree that this address is zero. I agree that this address is four. Question is, which one of these guys is one? Which one is two? Which one is three? So does it go zero, one, two, three? Or does it go zero, one, two, three? Ha, who says zero, one, two, three? Who says zero, one, two, three? Not so many? What did the Rust people say? <laughs> okay. So this is one of those weird things that happen, you know? Do you realize it's completely arbitrary? There would be some hardware, and as long as they do the same thing, it doesn't matter. One of them is address zero, one of them is address, I, who cares? I mean, uh, the moment you address it, you will get the right thing. Now, this thing started a little flame war because technical people cannot live without having to discuss these things endlessly. And this is the Endianness war. I mean, you know, you have it in every trial. Should it be left hand or right hand? Should it be VI? Should it be Emacs? Should it be? Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay, there you go. Should it be Rust or anything else? Whatever. So they fight and fight and fight. And this is like one of the most useless fights in the history of fights. But they do. How to number bytes within a word. Big Endian. Has the, uh, has the writing as 0, 1, 2, 3. The little Indian has it here, 0, 1, 2, 3. The name actually comes, uh, let's go to the next slide. The, it comes from the Jonathan Swift's uh, novel, Gulliver's Travel. Who knows Gulliver's Travels? Who thinks it's a child's novel? Who thinks it's a political satire? Okay, it's a political satire. And... Uh, he wanted to point out how useless some of those discussions are. And there, in this fictional world, there were these two uh, countries that were at war with each other over generations. And their beef was, what end of the egg do you crack when you want to open the egg? Was it the pointy end, the little Indians? Or was it the rounder end, the big Indians? And, you know, that was their religious issue. And in this fictional story, uh, two different countries were at war with each other, killing each other for years. So uh, it doesn't really matter what addressing type is made. The only issue becomes when you are exchanging data, let's say written, formatted, uh, between two computer systems that use different endianness. At some point, 
IBM used one endianness and Intel used the other endianness. So if you were doing things on an IBM computer and dumped your data and then transferred it over tape, disk, whatever, uh, to another computer that ran Intel, you had to be aware that those bytes were in a different order. It wasn't so difficult because, you know, you, you would have different programs. You could select and say, hey, this was from IBM, changed byte orders, or uh, do it that way. Uh, it's, once again, it doesn't matter which one is used, but uh, it ends up uh, making this thing. Here is the story. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to write the content of T0 to this address. This is the word. And then I'm going to uh, load one byte back. Essentially, I'm writing to, the, to this big address, this value. So it contains two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is written correctly. Why? Because it's the word address at zero. It will always be written correctly. That's not the issue. The problem is which byte address I'm reading back. If it's big endian, two, three would be zero. Four, five would be one, six, seven would be two, uh, eight, nine would be byte address three. If I'm little endian, eight, nine would be zero. And the number I read back from here would be different depending on the encoding that I make. So this is what you end up getting. And uh, well, is this a big deal? This is not entirely true, though. Uh, you wouldn't be having these issues because uh, there are already uh, assemblers, compilers that would compensate for it and put them also in the right order. Those things are also being made. Uh, however, uh, this discussion is only an issue when you move between two different systems that were implemented differently. So if this side of the room made it big endian, and this side of the room made it little endian, and you wanted to transfer your grades. Uh, some of you would get good grades, and some of you wouldn't. OK. So we saw some different types of instructions. And we realized that although I wanted to make all instructions look the same, so I wanted like this 32 bits to represent one instruction. And I was having like these good feelings. I think in 32 bits, I can make every instruction. And then you realize that like what I did for add and sub and what I did for load and store were not exactly the same. And say, uh, these use three registers. You know, there was dollar zero, dollar one, dollar two. And this one used like two registers and a constant. So you realize, OK, maybe one instruction type is not enough. Maybe I need to make more than one. But maybe let's not make it 50. Maybe we can limit it to two, three, four, like at most five. OK, OK, six, you know? So that kind of mentality is here. So we want to keep the number of instruction formats small. Why? Because whenever I see a sequence of zeros and ones, this is what an instruction is. I need to understand what's inside the instruction. And I don't want to spend an enormous amount of time trying to figure out, hmm, what type of instruction is this? Because trying to figure out would mean AND gates, OR gates, combination logic, delays, area, power, glaciers, melting, all those kind of things. And we don't want that. So we are trying to keep things smaller. Now comes funny things. We already saw the constants or immediates in the load word and store word. And you will realize when you're writing programs, we use an awful lot of constants in our calculations because, you know, there is an array that you increment by certain amounts because you go through the array or there's a structure you go through. So why don't I add also an instruction that can add not the value in the register, but directly with a constant. Add immediate. Ha, huh, such a nice name. So you take whatever is in S0, add minus 12 to it, and write the result to S1. 
that is b equals to a minus 12. Assuming that obviously uh, a is stored in S0 and S1 holds b, this one would work. Yes? We can do it with the normal ad, but in order to put it into the more normal ad, somehow we may have to move the value four into one of the registers. We need to do this somewhere. I mean, the, the some register like T4, you like T4, right? The T4 doesn't magically hold the value four. Somebody has to bring the value four to the register. So that would be one additional step. And you realize, hey, I already, because of this guy, I already have an instruction that uses uh, one constant and two registers. If I already have instructions that use two registers and a constant, I could reuse that constant and maybe instead of loading a word, do something else. So that I don't wait, I'm not wasteful. I have already something that looks very similar and I can take advantage of it. Now, all of this, what I'm saying makes more sense once you see the complete story, I agree. I'm slowly trying to bring you into it, but this is what's behind it. The, the person is, I mean, me, I'm not telling you the whole story yet. I'm trying to slowly convince you that this is a good idea. Who thinks so far MIPS is good? Oh boy. <laughs> They are far away, they don't hear, so they, you know, <laughs> they think I'm telling something else. Okay, so there was this question, how large is the immediate? Well, it's a 16-bit two's complement number. So it can be anything from plus 32,000 to minus 32,000. Do I need a sub E instruction? Who thinks I need a sub E instruction? Not a single person. Ah, you you're the only one listening. Do we need a sub E instruction? Sub immediate. Who says yes? Yes. <laughs> they decided that we, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> no laugh at the guys. I mean, come on. No, no, that's not fair. These guys had some civil courage and they said something while you were browsing your Insta pages. <laughs> Those guys actually said something. Come on, don't be mean to them. Why? I'll say why you don't, because the immediate can be positive or negative, right? So instead of having a separate instruction that subtracts, you could just play with the sign of the immediate you, you are playing with. So if you want to, you know, subtract minus 12, I love this class. You are looking for a moment to laugh at anything. <laughs> Phone ringing, let's laugh. <laughs> Positive. Okay, so we are trying to save at every possible location uh, some things. Now, let's come back to the real story. The machine language, the computers only understand ones and zeros. So they look nice, we write things like this. LW dollar uh, S3 comma one something something. But what the processor will see is going to be a number of ones and zeros, nothing else. So we need to convert them into this. And for MIPS, we will see uh, three different instruction formats for the moment. We will call one of them the R type, R type from register type, those. Uh, those instructions only operate on registers. Two registers are somehow combined together and the result will be written to a third register. Immediate types, I types, will be things where we have the constants and we have a J type, the jumpy type. We'll talk about that later, maybe tomorrow. Okay, so let's start with the R type. I'll just, because I like my chalk, I'll just try writing here R type. And uh, I need three registers, right? I need register one, register two, register three. How many registers do I have? 32. How many bits do I need to select or to express 32 numbers? I mean, the number up to 32? 
5. So 2 to the 5 is 32. So I need 5 bits to specify which register I want. So you say, OK, here in my R type thing, I will have 5 bits. So this is 5 bits for one register, 5 bits for the other register. They are supposed to be equal. OK, sorry. 5 bits for the other one. I already wasted 15 bits out of 32. But I needed three registers. That's where I put them, inside these, uh, inside these bit locations, inside the 32 bit. This is where I place them. Now, at the beginning, I'm putting a very strange thing. I say, this is, sorry, let's just have it. This is the operation code. And this is six bits. Six bits goes here. And for our type, especially, this is all zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is how you identify if a 32-bit number is an R-type instruction. First six bits, zero. Then the next five bits is going to be RS. Then the next five bits is going to be RT. The next five bits is going to be RD. Then there is the shame amount. It's the shift amount. Strange thing. We will see that hopefully much later. That's another five bits. And what remains is six bits. My God. And the six bits encodes then the function. Once we know that we have an R-type instruction, whether or not it's an add, it's a sub, or it's something else, and or XOR, whatever, will come into this function. So if you add them up, 5, 5, 5, 5, that's 20, 26, 32. I encoded 32 somehow into 32 bits my set of functions. Now, the moment I have decided this, I made a couple of choices. First of all, can I, how many different functions can I realize? Yeah, there can be only 64 uh, that type of instructions, R type instructions, right? Um, couldn't I have made more registers? It would have been possible, actually. I could say, let's say 200, let's have 64 registers, right? Then I would have needed six bits, six bits, six bits. Well, I need to save three bits from some of them, right? If, if I want to stay within 32, so this is the thing that bothered the people who are making MIPS. They said, I want to stay, I want to make sure that all instructions fit into here. Is this necessary? Absolutely not. But they realized that if, if they manage to do this, it will be efficient, small, cute, nice, writes good papers, whatever. And so that was a design principle. It's like guiding idea behind the choices they made. Let's try to stick this. And these end up being compromises. You realize you cannot have 10-bit uh, registers. Uh, you cannot have 1,000 registers. It won't fit. There's not enough room to put, well, you could put, you know, it's 32 bits. You could have three registers and nothing else. Basically, you have two bits. You can do, I don't know, not much. Does that? No. All right. Let's take a look. Here at the very top, add dollar S0, S1, S2. Now, we already talked about that the first six should be zero, right? Then there is RS, RT, RD. So the ordering, do I have another one? Yeah. The ordering is kind of strange because we write RD, RS, RT, and RS is the first one, RT is the second one, RD is the third one. Don't ask. That's how they came up with it. Um, okay, so RD, the S0 is 16. Why, why 16? Well, remember, we were talking about these. Uh, 
these guys. A0 was 16, S1 is 17, S2 is whatever, you know? So you know the numbers from here, it's, it's, it's already given. Ah, losing battle. <laughs> okay, don't lose faith. There. So register one, register two, register three. Shift amount, we are not doing any shifting. We don't even know what the shift amount is. So let's write zero in it. And then we choose a function. In this case, the addition ends up being function 32. This is 32, one, zero, 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 zero. And the second example is subtraction. Operant here, this time you use different uh, registers, T0, T3, T5. So those numbers end up being different. We are not shifting and the function is different. And that's it. You have a bunch of zeros, so zero, 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 one, one, zero. And if this is in the memory, this comes to the processor, uh, it will be just as pleased as you when you're saying, ah, oh, I subtract T3 from T5 uh, from T3 and write it to T0. Easy, let me do that. Here is T3, here is T5. Let's subtract them and let's write it back to this thing. What do I do next? You do next is 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Oh, easy. I add these two numbers and, you know, so this is how the program works. Who is disillusioned? No one. Continue. No jokes. <laughs> okay. Now we realize that this is not always going to work. So we have the I type instructions. Now we still try to stay regular, right? So the first six bits is now going to tell us which operation it is. It cannot be zero, but it can be something else because this one other than zero is going to tell us whether or not we are loading, storing, uh, adding immediates, not subtracting immediates or something like that. And I need two registers, RS and RT. It's good because I already had them here. So this is RS, RT, RD. So hop, this is the RS, this is the RT. Now you calculate six, five, five, that's 16, right? And the rest, well, the rest can be immediate. That's my constant. This part, I can do whatever I want. This one is available for me. Now, wouldn't you want to have a bigger immediate? Maybe. Would it have advantages if you had bigger immediate? Maybe. But it was a compromise. You know, you said for the operations, because two to the six, 64 different operations, and one of them, so 63 plus all the versions of these, so about 128 instructions I can support with this format. And I can have 32 registers and what's left ends up being the immediate. In this case, it was uh, 16. If you go to this five, you'll see that they use it slightly differently. So they have a smaller immediate. Yes. That's just me misspeaking. I mean, these are, I mean, single instructions. And uh, the operation, I mean, the difference here is they call this operation and they call this six bits the function. So operation, R type, function, you could, you could also say sub operation if you wanted it. I mean, it's, when you go and look into the names, they actually call it that way. Uh, see, OP, funct. Funny things happen with the naming. Okay, um, now it's, it's again the simplicity. If you, if you think about it, you get a 32 bit number and 32 bits is a lot. If you have to understand what the instruction is by you know, going through all 32 bits and say like, what does bit 31 say? It's a zero. What does bit 17 say? It's a one. Hmm, hmm, hmm. But here it's actually very simple. You get 32 bits, look at the first six. The first six is going to tell you what's happening. 
you are already smarter with only looking at six bits. And you know, you might only be caring about, let's say, R type operations. So you say, hey, wake me up when I see all six zeros. That's when I that's when I go to work, baby. Anything else doesn't interest me. Or vice versa. Ah, losing game. Okay. Here are some examples, and they're not so exciting, but let's try to take a look. First of all, we have to notice the difference order of registers in the assembly and machine codes. In the machine code, we have already decided this is RS, this is RT, but sometimes you use RT here, RS here, sometimes you use it differently, so uh, yeah. You know what the instruction means. You say this word is going to be written to what is inside this register plus the immediate. This thing is going to be written to what is in this register plus this immediate. I'm going to take the content of this register, add to this constant, write it back to this one. This is what it tells. And once you go, you see different operating codes. The first two are the same. The operating code is eight. In MIPS, eight means add immediate. 35 means load word, 43 means store word. I'm pretty sure there was a big commission to decide what numbers get assigned to what instructions. And these are the registers that are not so exciting. If you see, I always have two registers. These are the numbers. This one is the easy one, right? Zero, <laughs> register number zero, there you see. And then once you have them, those decimal numbers, you can directly convert to binary and then you have your 32-bit instructions. If you are a processor, what you end up doing is you will get a stream of these instructions that tell you what to do. The program will be a continuous zeros and ones coming to you at full speed, and at every instance, you will have to look at it and decide what to do. I'll add, I'll subtract, I'll explode. Sorry, question. Ah, this, this one is just for me, the stupidity. Uh, no, this is opt, sorry. This one is funk, yeah, sorry. So this is a function. If you want a sub operation, There is only an immediate, it's a constant value. Well, you can take, this is also the op, the op is R type, if you want. I mean, it's a special operation. If the operation is all zeros, you look at the function. Why not? No? You don't like it. Okay, what, what, what do you want me to do? <laughs> I mean, no, I, seriously, what is, what is the better choice? Sorry? Uh, okay. <laughs> you want this, I'll say op, funk, or whatever. <laughs> I mean, you look here, you understand what the rest of the thing does. You look here and you don't understand what the rest of it is, but you know that you will need three registers. And then you have to go and look here. This one says, boy, you have to work more here. And this one says, here, here, this is what you are doing. Uh, I want to say a not so pretty number like to the 16th minus two, something like that. Uh, is there a way to, as a variable, say like at EE, like to some two immediates, like a way to split immediate into two? Not, I mean, you could, you could come up with anything you want. However, the people who designed MIPS didn't think of that. You know, because yeah, there isn't such a function. So if no. you say eight three, something which is like, we can calculate it by hand, but a bit more readable, like two to the 16th minus two, for example. 
Like I could just write the number itself, but if I want it to be readable, I can't do that. I need to say you, 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 can, you can do it in a couple of steps, right? You, you don't have to do it yeah, once. So there is an immediate function. No. Okay. No. So this is, I mean, those are good questions. Why do, isn't there a function like this? Um, it boils down to the following, actually. Do you care about how fast your program works? Yes. You have your application. You write your compiler. We will, we will discuss about this when we talk about, uh, we will, in uh, three weeks, we will talk about more advanced processors. And you want to see how fast it works. How fast does it compute? How many seconds does it take for it to finish this job? And uh, you can make different choices than the choices you make, and you can experiment with it and realize and say and show to the people if your applications require, uh, there's a lot of uh, funny, uh, let's say, cryptographic functions that always require that kind of numbers and saying, you know what, we could extend the instructions by a special immediate, which I divide into two, and helps me, let's say, compress the uh, size of the uh, program. These are completely valid things, and we do this all the time. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out, is there a better way to do things? I mean, completely valid questions. Let me, allow me to go a few more slides. Now we have another one. This one is, it's again says op. I'm sorry for all the op haters. There is a J type, the jumpy type. And it has, again, the six. It has, again, uh, six bits that tell him what the uh, operation, the function, the jump, whatever is. And the full remaining 26, uh, 24 bits will be for uh, 26 bits, what am I doing? 26 bits, my God. 26 bits for the address. Well, it's not exactly 32, but it is relatively close. So that will have to do. With that type of instruction, hopefully, I'll be able to jump almost anywhere inside my memory, inside my program. And uh, I mean, it would have been great if this was 32, but you know, 26 is also not so bad. The good news is, for all three types of instructions, when you look at it, the first six bits tells you a lot. Tells you a lot what to do with the rest. You don't need to you know, do weird stuff, and there is 50 different versions of it. There's only three different types of instructions uh, for MIPS. And once you know them, uh, that's it. Uh, there is five is similar. I, I believe they have four. And you have it. Here is the same thing that I've been trying to draw. Uh, this time to scale and much better. You see how nicely they are also aligned. RS and RT are at the same place between the I type and the R type. When we are making hardware that decodes this and decides how, where to find them, what to do them, there is only one place to look for them. It's either there or it isn't. It's great. It's not like... Yeah, for the add, you have to take these bits. For the sub, you have to take these bits. For multiply, take a few bits from here, a few bits from here. Uh, so this is what happened in a lot of architectures where they try to expand, and then they realize, hmm, yeah, let's do it this way, that way. Now, what's great about this entire story is that we have a program uh, that keeps that looks ex actually exactly like any other data you want to have. You want to store integers? Well, it will be a bunch of zeros and ones. And since we operate on 32-bit numbers, my integers will be 32-bit. If you are operating with floating point numbers, well, guess what? They will be a bunch of zeros and ones. Uh, they will be in the memory somewhere. And you will operate on them, write them back. but. They will exactly look like this. And we have seen enough examples where addition, load word, store word, whatever, there are also a bunch of zeros and ones. And so you can store the same, at the same memory, you can store both data and memory. You just have to know how to interpret them. Where is the thing that tells you what to do? Where is the thing that is the data 
your your messages, your matrices you want to calculate, your values you want to store, you will have to decide on this thing. Now, somebody was asking how to run a program. Well, what you have to do is, at some point in your memory, you will store the program. Those are the ones and zeros that corresponds to these adds, loads, and things like that. They may not look like they do much, but those instructions are a few more, are sufficient to do more or less everything you want to do. And then one by one, you will go through them. You will read one instruction, do something, another one, do something, another one, do something, and continue. So you don't need to rewire the hardware. You can just change the program, the ones and zeros stored in the memory that corresponds to your program. And the processor hardware finds the instructions in the memory. Now, where does he find them? Well, someone has to point them where the program is. So there is, a, there is something that we call the program counter, which is a separate register. It's not part of the 32. And that one will tell you where the next instruction is to be found. Remember what we talked about sequential circuits. They could be, you know, the flip-flops, when you reset them, there could be anywhere. So if you reset a MIPS processor and don't do something special, when it wakes up, it could go anywhere. But we know that we can use a reset signal to tell him where to start. So by convention, MIPS programs are located at this address. Again, huge, uh, huge commission sat down and chose this address. But uh, 0040000 is the location by default, whenever you press reset, the program counter will go back to this value. You release the reset, he will say, what's here? That's my first instruction. Let's see what I'm doing. Am I booting an operating system? Am I executing a virus? Whatever it is doing, that's where I will start. So your program well, you will most probably not write in assembly. Your program, we will come to that end of next week. You will write in C, Perl, Pascal, whatever. It will get compiled to this assembly. From the assembly, there will be the direct hex translation of it. That one will be magically placed into the memory to the correct address. The program counter will be reset. And the first thing he sees is this 8C0A0020. Don't be surprised, it says load word 32 offset from zero into T2. That seems to be the most important thing to do because the moment he wakes up, that's the first instruction that he will be doing. Now, this is again how to interpret it once you have your hex number. So this is your uh, hex digits, you can convert it to binary. So I'll just take the lower one, 02F34022. So the first six bits, 00, R type. The next one says the first register, the second register, the third register, shift amount zero. And then the function is 34. 34 is subtract. These are the registers that are involved, T0, S7, S3. So he wants me to do this subtraction in operation. Believe it or not, this is what the processor will end up doing. He will take those 32 bits at every step, read through it, understand it, decide whether or not they are doing an R-type, I-type, J-type operation. If it's an R-type, there is more things to be discussed. We'll have to look at this sub-operation function. Uh, if it's an I-type, he already knows what to do. It's either a store, load, add immediate, whatever or we are jumping somewhere, the jump will modify the program counter, and then we will be done. So what did we learn? First of all, important things. We discussed byte addressable and word addressable memories, locations. We said that for historical reasons, MIPS is byte addressable. We looked at three different types of MIPS instructions. We didn't go through the entire list. We will do so. Uh, in exercises as well as uh, next week in the, in the lectures or maybe even tomorrow. We have R type that operates on registers, immediate type uses constants, and the jump type we didn't talk about yet, which will be this. Thanks a lot.
next week we will uh, tomorrow we will continue with memories and then go into programming